Nehemiah chapter 2. We're going to read verse 11 through 20, and then we're going to jump in together. So Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11 through 20. So I came, this is Nehemiah talking. He said, so I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Let me just give you a little background real quick. He is a cupbearer to the king. He hears Jerusalem is a mess. And so he's, he's weeping, he's praying. And finally the king said, what's wrong with you? Because normally you're happy and cheerful. And he said, how can I be happy and cheerful when my city's destroyed? And the king says, well, what do you want to do? Well, I want to go fix it. So the king says, go. This is where we are, okay? So verse 11, so I came to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what God, what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one on which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and to the refuge gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the others who did the work. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us rebuild or let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. When Sambalat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard of it, They laughed at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your grace. And Lord, you give us the tools that we need to prosper in the work you call us to. And I pray that tonight, God, you would give us vision. You'd give us clarity. Lord, you would give us tools that we would go out and equip and, and influence people, that you would equip us to lead in whatever context we're in, whatever setting we're in, or that we would learn how to leverage the influence you've given us to make a difference and bring good into the world. Lord, I ask you to, to teach us from your word. I ask that you, Holy Spirit, would you would speak to us and lead us so that we understand and we know what we ought to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Years ago, there was a uh, sports commercial with an NBA player. Uh, It was for Nike shoes, and the NBA player was Charles Barkley. And maybe you remember this commercial, but the commercial was, I am not a role model. You remember that? It it, it just was a simple commercial. It had Charles Barkley dunking every now and then saying, I'm not a role model. I'm not a role model. Then he dunks again. You know, I get paid to terrorize uh, opposing offenses, to score baskets. I'm not a role model. And then at the end of it, he says, Just because I can dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. And, you know, while he's trying to make a statement, and what he was trying to say is that I'm not responsible for everyone else. That that I can't be the only picture of what success is. You know, we all have a responsibility for that, but what he was actually saying or actually doing was illustrating a powerful point underneath the surface. And it's this, whether consciously or not, whether intentionally or not, whether we want to or not, we influence other people. Whether, whether, whether we think that's right and whether we want that responsibility or we want that pressure or whether we think it's fair or, or, or whether we just want to be left alone and we don't want anybody to follow us, it doesn't matter. People are still watching you. People are still influenced by you. People still see what you do and, and they're either influenced positively or negatively. No matter who you are, no matter what role you have. And as John Maxwell said, Leadership is influence. You influence people whether you know it or not, whether you want to or not, whether you, whether you intentionally do it or accidentally do it, you influence people, which, which, which according to John Maxwell means that you lead people. You lead people. So today I want to talk to you about redeeming influence and leading beyond what you see. Leading past what's visible to you. Proverbs 29.2 says, when the, wicked, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. In other words, when you have good leaders, people are happy. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. So when you have a good leader, everybody's blessed, 
People celebrate, they rejoice. When you have a bad leader, no one wants to be there. I mean, and how many of us have had bad leaders on the job? You know, already, you know, you've grown, right? You go to work, you're like, I don't want to go deal with this knucklehead. I don't want to deal with this person. I mean, you might be more holy and not use the word knucklehead, but, or you may be less holy and use other words, but I'm just saying, like, you begrudgingly go to work, right? Now, how many of you have had good leaders? And when you're around a good leader, you're like, I like this person. I like to be around this. I like this environment. I like what's happening. You know, and we get to be the kind of person that can either lead well, be a righteous leader, or we can be a wicked leader. There's no mid leaders. Amen. There's a lack of godly leadership in all segments of society. From the White House to our house, to God's house, and everywhere in between, the schoolhouse. I can keep coming up with houses, but I'm just telling you, everywhere you look, there is a lack of godly leadership. And unfortunately, the lack of godly leadership leads to the world being darker and life being harder, doesn't it? Jesus didn't take his followers out of the world. You ever, you ever kind of just be like, Jesus, what were you thinking leaving us here? Like, wouldn't it be better if he just took us, you know, you get saved and go to heaven right away and then don't have to deal with this world? Does anybody else think that would be nice? Like some days I'm like, you know, that would be great. I ain't got to deal with this nonsense. I could just be in heaven right now, praising God around the throne. It would be awesome. Eating heavenly food. I mean, I don't know, talking to Paul or Peter. I mean, something, right? But Jesus didn't take us out of the world. And matter of fact, when he prayed in John 17, he told the father, I'm not, don't take them out of the world. I'm leaving them in the world. And while they're in the world, I want them to receive grace to do something, to continue the mission that you gave to me. We, 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 are, we are left here by God on purpose, not abandoned. Jesus said, I didn't abandon you. I'm not gonna leave you like an orphan. I'm gonna come back for you. But God intentionally considered the needs of the people around you and decided that you were sufficient to meet those needs, that you were going to be an ambassador of redemption, a messenger of a new kingdom and a new way of life. So you have to understand that God has called you and appointed you to show people a better way to live, to redeem influence and help people find their purpose, to establish the kingdom of God in this life. We're not waiting for the kingdom to come. Jesus said the kingdom is already here. It's upon you. I came, the kingdom's here. But now as followers of Jesus, our responsibility is to continue to release kingdom influence, to extend his kingdom, to take dominion and take ground, just like at the very beginning, it says in Genesis chapter one, go have dominion, right? We're supposed to do the same thing, bring the kingdom of God into our lives, into our community and into our culture. Now, it seems to me that the world's methods of leadership and standards of success have kind of superseded God's. In other words, we've elevated what it means to be successful according to the world and what it means to be, you know, a leader according to the world above what God actually says in his word. When God says, this is how you do things and this is the target and this is the measure, we've decided, no, that's, that's not the goal. That's not the target. I want this one. I choose this one. You know, whether it's churches or communities or a country, we adopt and employ these methods. We use them. We pursue these goals. I mean, even in our homes or on the job, we find the influence of the world's view, their perspective, their ways on success and leadership, marriage and relationship. We find those things impact and influence the way we pursue our, our, the things in life. You know, the challenge is, is that in a, in a lot of these cases, and in large part, these methods work. They, they, they seem effective, right? They, they seem acceptable. And sometimes they even seem desirable. I mean, I want you to think, think about this. When you, if you were to ask a little kid, what do you wanna be when you grow up? I mean, a lot of them say things like doctor or astronaut or something like that, right? But, but, but have you ever asked them, kept asking them why? Why do you wanna do that? Often they'll start, it'll, go, it'll come down to, cause that job makes a lot of money so I can have a lot of stuff. That target, that goal, making money, having stuff, is something that, we, that has been ingrained in us since we were little. That's the goal, that's the standard, that is success according to the world system. So that's what we pursue. 
I want more money. I want more job. I want more prestige. I want, I want stuff. So how do I get stuff? I get the right kind of job that pays the right kind of money so I can get the right kind of stuff. And as long as I'm chasing that job and working in that situation, then I'm successful in this life, that I'm accomplished everything. And I, I honestly, I don't know anybody that wouldn't say that safety and security and financial peace are a bad thing, right? Anybody want safety and security and financial peace? I do. I want stuff. I'm not saying stuff is evil. These stuffs are not, these stuff, these things are not wrong. <laughs> there, there's nothing wrong with them. They're the, but the problem is, is they've never been the standards of, of success. They've never been the goal. They've never been the target. So we've been chasing the wrong targets all the time, our whole life. Every way, uh, the, the system of the world, the, the structure, the pursuits, the way that we work and the, the types of jobs we take, it's not who we're going to serve and who we're, how we're going to leave an impact. It's, it's how much money I can get. It's what is gonna give me the greater influence in terms of I can do what I want because we perceive money as control. Money is access. Money is, is, is everything according to the world. That's why Jesus called it the spirit of mammon, riches. Because money talks. Money is a powerful force. And the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, right? And you see that played out. And so here's the deal. If that's been our standard and if that's been our success, you can see how that how that influences the way we lead or, or, or what we do to get the job done, right? If, 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 if the greatest market share or the most people or the most money is the target, then I can do a lot of things as long as I get to that target. You ever heard someone say the ends justify the means, right? So if I say, as long as I'm, I can do whatever I need to do, I can cheat, I can lie, I can backstab, I can be amoral, I can rip somebody out as long as I get what I'm trying to get. And the goal is getting that money because when people see me with the money, they won't care how I got it. At least that's the lie, right? That's what we tend to believe. That's, that's what people, and, and whether that's in the world or whether that's in the church or whether that's in, 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 our, home, you know, in, in our own personal lives, this pressure is on us all the time. You know, I heard Dallas Willard describe a situation where he grew up in a, in a denomination, I believe he said Southern Baptist denomination, and um, he knew of a pastor that every few years would be rotated from big church to another church, to another church, to another church. Why? Because every few years, he would be caught up in some sexual sin. And so they would just rotate him around. Why? Why did they rotate him around? Well, here's the thing. He was a sought after speaker. When he preached, crowds came and churches grew, and money came. And so the denominational leaders were stuck. Do we rebuke this guy, correct this guy, deal with this guy, and sit this guy down for, for his sin? Or do we keep benefiting for the good of the kingdom? We win more souls, and we reach more people, and we make more money so we can build more churches, and we can do more stuff. The answer is really, what is your goal? Who's defining your standard? Because if your standard is and measurement of success is dependent on the way the world measure things, then, then, then reaching more people, then uh, making more money, then building more churches is definitely a desirable thing, isn't it? But if the standard of success is to raise up a godly generation of disciples, of Jesus followers, then it doesn't matter how many people you reach, it doesn't matter how big you get or how much money you make, you're not succeeding in God's eyes. Now, I want to say they're not mutually exclusive. Amen? You can have quality and quantity, but often we have been tricked into believing that quantity equals quality. And especially when it comes to, to church life or our spiritual life, Often we, we kind of feel that that's the way to go. The more blessed I am, the more I'm right with God. Or the more these external signs of, 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 of favor or goodness or success are around me, I must be doing good. Right? Isn't that kind of the undercurrent? You know, our, the biggest church in town is the most spiritually healthy one because look, they're growing. And again, I want us to grow. So I'm not knocking growth. But growth for the sake of growth is not the standard. Jesus said, go and make disciples, not build big churches. Amen? 
So your job, what does success on your job look like? It depends on what God defines it to be. In your home, what does successful parenting look like? What does a successful marriage look like? What does is, what is a successful uh, 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 employee look like? What does a successful business owner look like? See, where are we deriving our standard? Is it the world standard or God's standard? We, before we can get started in leading people and influencing people, we've got to get that settled. Like, what is my target? What is my goal? Who will I serve? And the issues, the issue of standards and methods of leadership is, is that they might be considered successful or good according to some max, metrics, but then are they successful according to God's? Do they live up to God's standard? I mean, can a church bypass some of God's, like compromise in some of God's standard and still accomplish some of God's goal? Maybe. Do you want to? Absolutely not. But what are we willing to compromise on? What are, what are we willing to overlook? Sometimes we need, to, we need to check ourselves. I mean, what does that mean for our lives? I mean, what does it mean? It means that we need to learn to influence, to redeem influence and lead others towards the purposes of God, towards the right standard, uh, towards the healthy metrics, right? For, the, for God's bottom line, if I can use business terms. God has called us and equipped us to influence others, to lead people to good, for their good. And ultimately, when we lead people to good, it brings God glory. Isn't that what Jesus said? You're the light on the hill. You know, when, when men see your good works, what do they do? They glorify God, your Father in heaven. You are called to influence people. You are called to lead people. You are called no matter what station you're in, no matter what segment of culture you're in, no matter what job you have, whether it's in your home to whether it's you're a CEO or a CFO or any C-suite person, a general, whatever role you have, you're there for a purpose. God pushed you there. God positioned you there. God left you there to lead and influence. So influence or leadership is something we all have the capacity for. And the goal of inf influence, the goal of our leadership is to bring about a common good in line with the purposes and glory of God. Right? Why do we lead? We lead for good, don't we? God left the church here to do good. What pleases God? Us doing good. Walking justly, right? Being humble. Isn't that what God said? That's, that's what the, the, whole be, the whole thing of man is is do good, love justice, walk humbly. But we do that not just for our good, but we do that according to the plan and purposes of God. So for the Christian, this is the standard. This is the standard for us that are in this room. This is the standard for us that are wa uh, watching online. This is the standard for those that say, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. The standard isn't wealth. The standard isn't stuff. The standard isn't more platform so I can influence more people while I'm shortcutting over here or not walking in character. The standard is to, to walk people towards the plan and purpose of God. More than wealth or status, and those aren't bad. More than increase and reach and market share, the standard is to bring the kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? It's the range of God's will and what he, when, when what he wants to get done gets done. So in every aspect of life, what God wants to get done, gets done. That's where the kingdom is. Amen? Simple definition. Where's the kingdom of God? It's where God gets what he wants done, done. In the world. So we can leverage our influence and leadership for godly purposes. And when we do that, we bring redemption and justice and righteousness into the world that we live in. Into our homes, into our jobs, into our churches, into our cities communities, country. Nehemiah went from being a cupbearer to a, to a governor. He was a cupbearer to the king. Think about that. In a foreign land. He was, he was not even a free person. You know what a cupbearer did? They drank the cup to see if there was poison in it. That's the job Nehemiah had. 
Who wants that job? Not today. That was he. So, so what kind of sad, what kind of status did he have? He had negative status because his, his job was to take a bullet. I guess he'd be like secret service, but less cool. Right. He went from that job to what being a governor over, over Israel and overseeing the restoration and revival of a nation. Rebuilding walls, architecting the movement back to worship with Ezra. From being a cupbearer to being a governor, big, big jump. In his story, we, we started reading a part of it. His story offers us some clear ways that we too can lead others into good works and bring about a common good that results in the praise and honor and glory to God. So if you're ready to take some notes, point number one is get a clear vision. Every leader needs to get a clear vision. We're going to look at verse 11 through 18 again. Just I'm going to kind of go through this quickly, but just so that way we, we recapture the story. So he came to Jerusalem, was there for three days. I rose in the night, I and a few men with me. I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except for the one of which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates, which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool and there was no room for the animal under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and I viewed the wall and I turned back and entered the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials or others who did the work. But then verse 17, he starts telling them what he saw on his trip. Then I said to them, you see the distress that we're in and how Jerusalem lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us rebuild the, or let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them that the hand of my God, which had been good upon me and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. To lead well and influence others, we have to have a clear vision of what is and what should be. What is and what should be. And then we have to be able to articulate that vision well enough so that we can positively influence people towards decision and action. I mean, think about this. Before he went to Jerusalem, Nehemiah's a cupbearer. And was he here? Somebody coming back from his city, coming back from his nation saying, the walls are burned down. The city is burned down. There's ashes, it's rubble. It's all over. The place where you grew up, when you played, where, where you played as a kid, the place where your, your, the cemeteries are, where your grandpappy was buried, where your family is, has got their spot. That place is in ruins. So he has this picture in his mind, like what is going on here? Because he remembers what it was, what it was, what it was like, what it was supposed to be. And now he's hearing it's something else. And so he shows up in the place where God had placed his name. You remember that, right? Jerusalem was the place where God placed his name. And Nehemiah has this picture of this beautiful city, this wonderful place where God shows up, but it's not that anymore. It's torn down, it's destroyed, it's wrecked. It was incomprehensible to him that this situation was the way it was. How could God's temple be looted? How can the city be torn down? How can anyone let this happen? How can we bear to stand it that this place is the way it is? How can this condition be okay? And so what does he do? Obviously, he, he talks to the king and the king sends him. And so when he shows up, the first thing he does is start looking around. He surveys the city wall. He evaluates, he examines, he says, what is the scope of the problem? What's the issue? What's, what's broken? What's wrong? What's not right? And then he compared that to the vision of what it was supposed to be. He looked at the conditions and said, this isn't the picture. Let me go back and remember what it was like. Let us believe again what it should be. To lead someone effectively towards a purpose or goal, you need to know what that is. How are you going to lead your job if you don't know what the goal is? How are you going to lead your family and raise your kids? What is your goal for raising your kids? What is your goal for your marriage? How are you going to lead in your home? What is your goal on the job? You know, how are you going to influence people towards God's plan and God's purpose? How are we as a church going to walk in the plans and purpose of God without knowing what that looks like? What about your spiritual life? How are you going to lead yourself well if you don't even have a vision of what that's supposed to look like? We have to get a vision from God of what should be, what could be. 
And sometimes that starts by looking at what is and what isn't. In his case, the wall wasn't up. In his case, the walls were torn down. That was not the goal. The goal was a restored Jerusalem where the glory of God dwelt. Seeing the goal, seeing the outcome, seeing what should be or what could be allows you to recognize the purpose behind why you're doing what you're doing. So many of us don't accomplish anything and aren't successful because we have no purpose. And we have no purpose because we don't have a goal. We don't have a vision. We're not going towards anything. We're just going. There's a, there's a story that I read, and, and I'll kind of summarize it here. But uh, I want you to imagine you were in medieval times, and you're walking down a road, and uh, you come around a corner, and you hear all this dust. You see all this dust flying up. You hear all this noise. You hear guys shouting. You see a, a guy with a sledgehammer just pounding on some rock, and he's pounding on this rock. And you, you go up to him because you're like, what is going on here? You say, uh, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? You know, what's going on here? The guy said, can't you see? What's it look like I'm doing? I'm smashing rocks. I'm breaking rocks. So you're like, okay. And, and all right, you're breaking rocks. Okay. So you start moving down the road again. You get up a little around another corner. And all of a sudden there's another guy with a sledgehammer just smashing the rocks. Just smashing. You go, uh, excuse me, sir. What, like, what, what are you doing? Why are you smashing the rocks? And the guy says, Liz, can't you see I'm making a living? I'm putting food on my table. This is my job. I'm, I'm out here working. I'm making a living. I'm putting food on my table. I'm making sure my kids don't go hungry. Clothes on their back. That's what I'm doing. And you're like, okay. Then you go around the corner, one more corner. And all of a sudden you run into one more guy. And you're like, what is going on here? These guys are hitting rocks. Sir, why are you hitting rocks? And the guy says, oh, I'm making a cathedral. These rocks are going to get taken from the quarry to, to the church. And we're building a house for God. So what am I doing? I'm building a cathedral. See, How we look at what we're doing has a significant impact on why we do it and if we want to keep doing it. Listen, in life, if all you're doing is breaking rocks, you hate your life. I would say that if all we're doing is making a living, we're not very happy either. But if we have a higher purpose, if we know that we're building something great or doing something impactful or doing something meaningful and something good, we go all in. Our attitude changes. Our, our posture changes, our position changes. And it was because of the way that Nehemiah saw the situation that allowed him to undertake such a great work. Do you know he rebuilt the wall? They rebuilt the wall in 52 days around an entire city. Why? Because of the purpose. What was the purpose? To restore, to bring back honor to God, to restore, to lift off the reproach. And because it was such a great purpose, it, it, it enabled Nehemiah to inspire others to get involved. I mean, how many of y'all would, if I came up to you and said, hey, I need you to help me break rocks, you'd be like, oh yeah, I'd sign me up. Nobody, right? If I say, I'll pay you $20 an hour to help me break rocks. Some people might say, okay, I'll take $20 an hour. Well, if I say, listen, we are going to work together and we are going to go bust some rocks so we can build a church. Maybe more people will say, I'm down for that. Or even, or even let me switch it. Let me make it really, really heart stringy. We're going to go build an orphanage. I got you there. You might not say, oh, we don't need another church, but an orphanage, yes. Right? But the difference is, is, is what, your, what your goal is. It changes your whole attitude about it. It changes your whole perspective on it. I'm not just building a relationship. I'm building a great marriage. Let's go. I'm not just raising kids and dealing with rugrats. I am raising world changers. Amen? Like, we're not just having a church. We're making disciples of Jesus who changed the world. Let's go, right? Big difference. And it's because that he saw it differently. He could do that. Now, I want to point out some things, and this is part of redeeming influence. I want to point out kind of a natural model of, of leadership, of influence, and I want to kind of redeem it. I want to point it out here, okay? So listen to how he communicates his vision. And you're going to want to write this down because you're going to want to use this. Amen. Now, don't use this to manipulate people. Amen. Remember, we have a standard that we live up to. But I want you to know that these components are almost irresistible for many people. If you throw all these together, people are going to move more often than not. So what did the first thing he do? He brought a few people with him so they could focus on the problem and identify the opportunity. People are more likely to follow your lead when they know where you're going, right? 
when you know when they know there's a reason. Listen, listen to this is probably around verse 18. But he says things like, You see the distress. Jer- Jerusalem lies in waste. It's burned with fire. We're a reproach. Do you hear the language he's using? He's like, look at what's wrong. This is the problem. This is the problem. Listen, you know, if you have people who are out there right now, you know, how many of y'all are aware of like Christine Kane and A21? You know what they do? They, they rescue women out of sex slavery. Now, how do they, part of the way they do that is they tell you how terrible it is. They offer you statistics. They start telling you stories about uh, abuse and about how women are captured when they're kids and how young boys and young girls are snatched up off the streets and how they're forced into the situation and treated like objects. And what are they doing? They're focusing your attention on the problem. This should stir you up. This is wrong, right? So what, when we're influencing people, we want to focus on a problem or an opportunity. Amen? And there was both here. And then listen to the next thing he did. He leveraged authority. The authority that he'd been given as a way to influence others who are doing the work. Notice that he said he, it, it was for God and it was under the official order of the king. He said, the hand of my God was on me. God gave me favor. And then he said, and then I told him the king's words. So what was he doing? He was referencing authorities greater than himself. Right? What's, what's, what's like one of the most important authorities that we can reference as Christians? The Bible, the word of God, right? If, if, if I want to encourage you to live to God's standard, what am I going to do? I'm going to appeal to the authority of scripture. Amen? You're going to appeal to authority. And then the next thing he did was identify that this was a community issue. You know, it's not just his own personal agenda. What did he say? The distress we're in. Let us build that we may no longer be approached. He was inclusive. He was saying, this is our problem. And there are other people that have a problem with this. And together, we got to do something about this. And then finally... He appealed to them emotionally by showing them the conditions and painting the picture in such stark terms, right? He, he took those guys with him. And he said, look at this. Look at these walls. See that over there. That man, I remember playing over here and now it's destroyed. I remember kids used to go to the park over here. And I remember, I remember dogs, you know, over here. I mean, you know, he started talking to them and said, look, now it's burning. Our city's burned. We're, we're, it's light. It's laid in waste. The, the temple of our God is profaned. Look around you, smoke still coming up. I mean, it's terrible. This same approach uh, is used by many marketers and leaders to influence us to make a decision. It's actually called the fate model uh, by a guy named Chase Hughes. The, The F was focus, the A was authority, T, I said community, but he says tribe, and E is emotions. And let me give you a picture of this like, on TV, how many of y'all have seen those like ASPCA commercials where, where the Humane Society for Dogs and Cats and they're rescuing dogs and cats and you've got this, this, this uh, uh, actor or this, this uh, artist or someone who's, who's lending credence to the message and what are they doing? They're showing you pictures of like beat dogs and, 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 and shaking animals and mistreated and abused. And what are they doing? Making you mad and making you sad and pulling your heart because why? These dogs are left out in the cold and we could do something about it. And they're appealing to the authority of, of someone who you might admire and someone you might say, we can fix this. All we need is for you to join us in the cause, to give us a little money. And then what happens? Often we get pulled into that because who wants to see a little dog shaking? No one. Now, cats, we, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) If we're going to influence people and lead them towards purpose, then we have to develop a vision for what should be and what could be according to God. Not just what we want it to be. This is what, you know, marketers and, and leaders want you to do. They want you to get a hold of what they want, their picture, their desired outcome, their message, their ideology, their perspective. But if we're going to lead well and lead righteously and bring people into a place where they rejoice because of the goodness uh, that, that God's vision brings for their lives, then what we have to do is we have to get a vision from God and say, How, God, I see this problem, but what's the answer? 
Or God, I, ha I have to hear from you, God, like what needs to change here on my job? How can we change this? What could this look like? And sometimes that means we look at what is and realize this is not it, right? But what do we got to do? We have to evaluate those conditions and begin to share the vision and make it plain so that those that run with it can, right? All right, point number two, we make decisions, not excuses. Make decisions, not excuses. Verse 18 through 20, Nehemiah told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to this good work. But once I'm gonna skip down to verse 20, uh, it says, so I answered them, the God, of him, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right memorial or memorial in Jerusalem. So let me ask you a question. You ever failed to follow through on your good intentions? I mean, there's plenty of times where I intended to do something and just didn't. And sometimes those are good things, right? I mean, most of us know that intention and willingness to act is only actual possible when we make a decision to follow through. We can want to do things generally, but we don't do things unless we decide to. Amen? So we have to be intentional in deciding what we will do and how we will do it, or it probably won't get done. Remember after I hurt my back, I was in the, I was in with the doctor and I was, I was telling the doctor, you know, this whole situation kind of made things worse. I had gained a, a good amount of pounds, you know, sitting around in my chair because I couldn't do anything with my back. And, and I was like, I'm going to lose some weight. And the, and the doctor's like, well, that's a great idea. That will really help you. And that will help your health and it will help your mobility. And then she turned around and said, and how are you going to do that? But I already had a plan. So I told her my plan. I told her how I was going to do that. I didn't just say, I want to lose weight and not do anything about it. I had a plan. I had made a decision and I started working that decision. Praise God, in the last like month and a half, I've lost like 15 pounds because I made a decision. I didn't just generally say I wanted to lose weight. I've, I've, I've made a decision. I'm going to lose weight. And then I started acting on it. See, having a clear vision and, and a goal is only part of the process of leading and influence. We have to go beyond good intentions. We have to go beyond just stated goals if we're going to truly help people find purpose and see kingdoms, God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We have to make decisions to act. It's, it's often when we don't make decisions, we make excuses. Well, I didn't do it because of this. I didn't want to do that. I didn't feel like it. I didn't, you know, conditions weren't right. It was raining outside. I was sleepy, whatever. I mean, we make excuses. Why? Because we never really decided how we were going to do it or what we were going to do. We just kind of said, I'll, 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 maybe I'll do it. Decisions are about moving forward. Excuses are about keeping us stuck. Amen? Now you can have reasons. Reasons why. But never excuses. Excuses keep you pinned. They keep you stuck. They keep you from moving forward. Reasons are just opportunities to move around. Obstacles to overcome. As you decide, I'm moving forward. And after Nehemiah communicated the vision, the people together decided with him that they would what? Rise up and build. He, he showed them the picture. He told them this is wrong. He showed them and told them what should be. And what they say? We'll do this. We'll, we will arise and build. We let us build this city back. They made a decision that day. And then finally, point number three, do good works. In verse 18, he said, I told him the hand of my God, which has been good upon me and also the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. There's their decision. And listen to this. They set their hands to this good work. Good work. They called it good. See, it wasn't any old job. It wasn't just repairing broken walls or cleaning up our neighborhood. It was a good work. It was a good work. Along the same lines of the building, the cathedral story, I heard uh, Michael Jr., who's a comic, and he was talking about uh, he was talking to a mechanic and he said, what do you do? And the guy said, I'm a mechanic. And so he started talking to him about that a little bit more. And finally, guy, guy says, you know what? Actually, I'm not just a mechanic. He says, I, I facilitate people getting to where they need to be. What can, I mean, you know, being a mechanic doesn't make you get up in the morning. But being the person that makes it possible for other people to get where they got to go, that just kind of changes it, doesn't it? It goes from being just work to being a good work. 
It goes from being just a general thing that I do to something I, I do that matters. It was good. This, this work that they were doing to rebuild the wall was good because it was, it was in alignment with godly vision. It was the product of intentional decision. When it's right and noble and just and true, then we can get behind it and act, right? You know, if you don't believe in something, you don't think it's worth your time, do you want to get behind it? You might begrudgingly get behind it. You might be like, well, everybody's doing it, so I might as well. But when it's something you believe in, something you think matters, something you think that's important, then you say, I'm all in. I'm behind this. I'm for this. I'll do the work. When we do good work and act, then change comes and transformation comes and people rejoice in the goodness of God. So when you're on the job or when you're in the home or when you're in church and there's a clear need for something to change, a clear vision that's being cast, you have to decide, I'm going to get on board, and then you actually have to work. Influence is work, right? It's, it's, it's watch and see what I do. You know, it's so many times we want people to not listen to what we say. That we want them to do what we do, right? Actually, as Christians, we want there to be a congruency. Do what I say and do what I do because what I say is what I do. But I, 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 you may say, I believe this, but your behavior tells me otherwise, this is where a lot, of, a lot of Christians turn people away. The number one reason why people don't love God and don't want to go to church is because they're hypocrites. Because they're being influenced by people who say one thing and do something else. Never underestimate in your desire to influence people and lead people the power of your own actions. It's important to recognize one last thing when it comes to this story and our calling. And I want to point this out for you because this is critical for, for many of us. There are some people today say, I don't know what I'm called to. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what God has for me. I want you to picture what Nehemiah was going on. Nehemiah, when he began to identify what was broken and what was neglected and what needed to change, it was at that moment he began to walk in his calling. He went from cupbearer to governor because he had a vision of what could be and should be and acted on it. No one else saw that Jerusalem was down and, and the walls were broken down and they weren't broken by it. They weren't crying about it. They weren't trying to do something about it. He did. No one else was talking about it. No one else was organizing anything. He did. Why? Because that was his calling. There are things that you see that, know, that you know in your heart needs to change. There are things that you see that no one's doing, no one's talking about, but you keep seeing it, you keep thinking about it, you keep talking about it. Why? Because probably you're called to it. We say, I'm waiting for my call. No, what do you see that needs to be fixed? What do you see that doesn't have the glory of God on it? What do you see that's wrong and broken? Christine Kane, I mentioned her. What did she see? Women being trafficked. So what did she do? Something about it. She didn't turn away. She didn't just say, oh, I'll pray about it, brother. You know, what'd she do? She went after it. And maybe your thing is not that big of a thing. Maybe you just see that, that you want to make a positive influence in the school system. So what do you do? You teach there. Maybe you just see that, that you need to be the most powerful present force in your kid's life. So what do you do? You homeschool them. I don't know what it is that you're going to see. But you're going to see things around you that aren't right, that, that, aren't, that aren't what they should be or aren't what they could be. And that's an invitation from God for you to step into your calling and begin to go from cupbearer to governor. If we'll pursue clear vision, make decisions to act in, in the pursuit of that vision, and then do the good work necessary to carry out that vision, we may well discover our purpose and our calling. And as we invite people into the process, we'll find that we'll be influencing them and leading them for good. And ultimately, that'll bring about God's glory. This is part of our high calling of God and Jesus to bring positive influence and leadership to people in our lives, to our community, to our culture, to the world around us. So let's redeem our influence. Let's leverage the leadership sphere that God has given us for the glory of God and for people's good. Let's look at what, what's happening around us. And I mean, guys, I, you know, we can break this down to really simple things. You know, uh, uh, one thing that I'll, you know, just pops in my mind right now is, is Pastor Chris, one of the ways that he influences and leads that I think is one of the most profound and one of the best is that when he sees trash in the parking lot, he never, he never looks past it, never leaves it there. 
he will stop, stoop down, and pick up trash all the time if he sees it. Sometimes I've been walking with him and felt bad because I didn't see it because I ain't looking down. And then he stops and bends over. I'm like, oh, I'm a dummy. I could have got that, but too late. What is he doing? He's influencing me to look around, to be aware. That trash isn't too little, but trash matters. Why? Because just like anything, you know, if, if our whole building was trashy, if it stunk in here, it was dirty, and you saw stuff, you know, all over the place, you wouldn't want to be here. Trash matters. We clean it up. That's why we have a cleaning team that comes out on Tuesday nights to clean. Amen? So it doesn't matter. I mean, what is the problem? What is the challenge? What are the things? There are all kinds of opportunities that, that should be different, that could be different. And most likely you're seeing that and someone else isn't seeing that or you're upset about that or you're stirred by that and someone else isn't because you're called to it. Amen? And they might be called to something else. So then when you have a vision, you look around and say, who's coming with me? Because like John Maxwell says, if someone thinks they're a leader and no one's following them, they're just taking a walk. Amen? So we're going to look around and, and, and invite people because it's, it's other people with us that a lot, he couldn't build that wall in 52 days by himself. Could he? But he had to find other people that he could say, guys, look, this is what we can do. And together, they did great things. So let's lead beyond uh, what we see. Let's lead beyond our circumstances. Let's lead beyond the thing right in our hands. Let's lead beyond this present moment and let's lead into a redemptive future beyond of what could be with God, of what God wants to see. Because with God, all things are possible, amen? We can, we can cha- you can change your job. You can change the culture in your home. You can change the culture in the school. You can change the outcome if you redeem your influence. So I want to ask God to bless us and help us, to help us grow in this. Because this is bigger than just church. Though I want you to apply this in church, amen? Lead in the church. Serve in the church. Lead children. Lead cleaning teams. Lead ministry teams. Lead. But this is bigger than that because we're kingdom people. And wherever we go, we want to bring God's kingdom and lead others into an encounter with God, his goodness and his glory. Amen? So, Father, I thank you for your grace tonight. And I thank you, Lord, that you have equipped and called all of us to leadership, to influence, to make a difference. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grab a hold of a vision. I pray, God, that you would help us to make that decision on what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Lord, we don't have to be locked into it. We just have to decide we're going forward with you, and this is the first step. And then, Father, I pray that you would also, Lord, you just help us to do the good work to carry out that decision, to not hold back and not wait for someone else, but for us to say, well, no one else is doing it. I see it. I've decided I'm going to do it, even if no one else does. And then, God, as we go, Lord, let us look around us for the people you've positioned who are called to a similar vision and a similar purpose, who you've given us to influence for their good and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.